So for our next operation, I think what we'll go ahead and do is we'll go ahead and set it up in the lathe and get our bore down through there. So we'll have a, a bore that goes all the way through and I've got that one at, let's see. Okay, there's the dimension up there. One and three eighths with a quarter inch wide shoulder at the bottom. And then it'll be bored to fit our aluminum tube that I showed you at the beginning of the video, which is right around one and five eighths. But now that I got it polished, we'll have to mic that tube and we'll give it about a five thousandths uh, clearance down inside this hole. So we'll get our whole location laid out, scribed on there, and then we'll go to a four jaw chuck in the Precision Matthews manual lathe and go ahead and get it drilled and bored. So it's going to be one and five eighths from that edge. We're just going to put some blue on there and then we're actually going to scribe this. So somewhere about in that area right there, inch and a quarter, one and five eighths. We got you on the stair at granite plate. We'll use our digital height gauge here to lay out the location of that hole. So we're going to be one and five eighths from the bottom that we're sitting on. We've got our height gauge zeroed out right there. So we'll just go up to one and five eighths. Use the fine adjust on the back there. All right, one, in, one at 625. Just verifying that, that I got that right. One at 625. All right, and then now we will just make sure there's no chips on that side. So the next one's going to be inch and a quarter. All right, there's our hole location. All right, we're going to use a nice sharp prick punch to find the center of this scribe line that we made. Go ahead and get my hammer ready. How about that? I usually just try to set the punch in the scribe line and then drag it till you feel the, the two lines meet. I would love to use my optical center punch for this, but it is at the home shop and I need to get me one for here. So that feels good. It fell right in that hash mark there. That'll work. We'll use this to line up on our center whenever we go to the lathe. We'll put a spring center in this and indicate it with a dial indicator. We got our four jaw chuck mounted on the lathe. I've already got it pre-centered and we've got the one jaw offset and we're ready to put it in there. Going about like that. So I'm gonna use some brass shim stock here to keep from marring up our aluminum. All right, we'll put our centers in there and we're gonna get the center punch lined up in the center. All right, so to do this, we're gonna use a live center in our tailstock here, but you can use any center. It doesn't have to be a live, you can use a dead center. And I'm gonna use the spring-loaded center there as well. That side's machined, so it'll line up on the center here well. And then we're gonna line that punch mark up with the center tip and just put some preload on it. Oh, we gotta lock the tail stock. Just put a little preload on it, just like that. And now I gotta find my dial indicator and we'll set that up. Okay, we got our dial indicator. Just put some preload on the dial. Anywhere along the center is fine. 
let's see where we're running out at. All right, so we got 75, 80, about 75 or 80 thousandths run out right there. Now all you're gonna do is loosen your lows and tighten your highs. I'm gonna start with the, with the high just to make sure it's tight. And then that's one of our lowest points. We're gonna loosen that jaw, pull around to your high and push it in. Careful not to over tighten it. You're just moving it at this point right now. Now that's our high and that's our low. So loosen the low, tighten the high. Low, high. Low, and it kind of split it there. So now, now our high is there. It'll jump between the, the two uh, jaws. So now you're down to a few thou and you're just tightening up your high highs at this point. You got your brass shim in there so it's not gonna dig in and mess up your, your surface. We're within a thousandths right there. I'm gonna bring this up so I can see it in line a little bit closer. So that's a half a thousandths. And you can just dial this in as much as you want, but that is, remember that's a scribed and punched center. So that's not gonna be dead accurate there, but it's gonna be well within the tolerance of what it needs to be at that point. So there you go. Well, just double check all four jaws to make sure that they're snug and they are. And when you do that, if it's running out a little bit, you just tighten up your high. So less than a half a thou run out on that spring center right there. We're ready to go. All right, order of operations for the lathe. We're gonna start with a spotting drill. We're just gonna spot that. And then we're gonna put in this uh, stubby length, half inch drill right there, go about the length of the flutes get a hole established. Then we'll go all the way through there with a standard half inch jobber drill all the way through. And then we'll follow up with an inch and a quarter taper shank drill. And that'll just be our, our clearance hole. We'll bore it to one and three eighths. That's gonna be our bore on the back end. And then our counter bore is gonna be to one and five eighths or to uh, match our tubing over there. We're using a one inch boring bar with a CNMG 431 insert made for aluminum. Maybe that'll make a nice chip in there. So we've already got a touched off established DRO set to the size that that bore is. And we're gonna take it to one and three eighths so that the back end is at one and three eighths. And then we'll counter bore it uh, down three and a quarter deep to our one and five eighths. Just have one more cut here to uh, to make to get it to our one and three eighths. Yep. So we got about 25, 24 thousandths to come out of it. 
I'm just using my good old school dark cutting oil for this. Helps lubricate the cut and helps keep the chips from galling up in there as it's rotating. Back off on the cross slide so you don't drag on the bore. That looks pretty good in there. Like I said, that is not a critical dimension, so I was just shooting for one and three eighths there and about. Let's see cl how close I got it with their calipers there. I saw 373, so close enough, a couple thou off. Now I'll just go ahead and we know we're at one and three eighths. I'm gonna just come up here and just touch the face, just like that. I'm gonna establish a depth on our DRO. Let's see here. All right, so we got our Z and I'm gonna go, I'm just looking at my print. Uh, one and five eighths is three and three quarter, just referring to my print right here. One at 635, 3.75 deep. So we're gonna go, uh, let me see, I believe it's negative 3.750, enter. Yep. So we'll take that to zero. That'll be our, that'll be our shoulder depth right there. Coming up to our zero. Need to go refill the oil can. Let's take another hundred thousandths. Five seventy five. All right, here's our tube. Just very lightly clamped in the vise, but we're far enough away that we shouldn't be distorting it. Got our one to two mic, and I just want to get an average reading of what this is. I don't expect it to be perfectly round. That's 631, 1.631. Let's see what it's measuring, 180, or I'm sorry, 90 degrees. 631, it is pretty round. 632, so I'll check it in a few more places. 631, I'm looking for the highest reading. It's 632, so that's the biggest that I've read so far, 632. And that's right there at the end. So let's just call 1.632 being our largest diameter. Uh, so 30, 32. Let's just give it, you know, plus four thousandths. We'll shoot for plus four thousandths on this uh, sliding in there. So 32, three, four, five, six, 636. That's going to be our target. 1.636. See where I'm at on our bore size. Let's see if it's matched up to our DRO very, very close. It's be around 1.576. Five seventy three, about three thou off. Let's take about half of that.
All right, this should be our final pass through here. All right, that is 602, about 34 thousandths, if I got this right. Yep, 1.602, we want 636, 34 thousandths. See if I hit my target. I say we're there. 636. Good. Let me go in there a little bit further and make sure it's good. Oh. Just double check in. 636. I'm going to walk over here to the tubing still in the vise and make sure my bike clears and it does. I think that's going to be good to go. So that's technically giving us fourth dial clearance and I'm happy with that. I can't test it because it's too long, but I know we got clearance there. So we'll, all we need to do is just chamfer this side right there. Uh, I'll just do a manual deburr on the back side once we take the block out. All right, let's just put us a nice chamfer on this. I want something a pretty decent size so it'll help guide that tube in there every time we set it in. Cutting all to help. I think something about like that should be good. I'm just going to go ahead and take it out of there. It should fit. Oh yeah, we got a nasty burr there, but like I said, I'll just use my Noga and deburr that guy and get that. I just didn't want to have to deal with reaching in there with a bar and making sure we're on our proper location, but we'll get that manually. I'm gonna get all this cleaned up so that this is finished. See how it fits. Like it was made for it. I think that's going to be a good fit. Four thousandths is plenty of clearance and it's going to keep it from flopping around in there. So I'm good. I'm happy with that. All right, next up, we're going to go back to the mill. And I think we'll go ahead and we'll put our split in there to split this. And then after we split it, the last thing that we'll do is be drilling it and tapping it for our two uh, clamping bolts. I'm gonna go ahead and get our two holes drilled in here. This will be drilled and tapped. This is gonna be for our clamp bolts and our split's gonna go this way. I wanna go ahead and do these and get these finished because I would like to go ahead and uh, rotate the vise 90 degrees in line with our x axis right here for our splitting so I can just use the power feed with our with our splitting slitting saw all right so we've got it sitting there on some parallels mounting bolts on the back we have our two drill holes here all right and I've got our dimension of where they're going to be half inch from this edge in and then centered two and a half inch center to center right there so we'll have a 3 8 drill that's going to go down halfway through that, a 5 16 drill that'll go all the way through. That's going to be for our 3 8 tap size. And then this is a uh, counterboring tool, 3 8 pilot, 9 16 counterbore, which is the proper size for our 3 8 socket head bolts. I don't have those bolts yet. It's the weekend right now. I'll be picking up all the bolts for this on Monday whenever the, uh, the bolt place opens up. 
So everything looks good. I'm lined up where I should be. We're gonna have a split going right down this side after we drill it and tap it. I'll just do the tapping over on our flex arm again since I've got the 3 8 tap set up in the, in the vise. So make sure this is good to go. All right, let's get going on this. All right, so that's gonna be two and a half, so inch and a quarter each way. We'll just go ahead and line up on inch and a quarter. And we want our half inch from the edge this way. Make sure that's half. Half inch plus 100. I want to get a full radius established here. That looks good. And lock our quill so I can set a stop here. I want to go halfway, which is going to be inch and a quarter because our block is two and a half inches. So we're going to set our quill stop up here. I'll show you what I'm doing here in a second to inch and a quarter. All right, so we'll come down to here. Inch and a quarter, it'll be halfway. I'm just gonna double check that. It sure seems like it's going deeper. I know that it's probably not, but I don't wanna make a mess up here. So I think that was our top inch and a quarter, two and a half, halfway, okay. All right, that'll be the bottom there. Yeah, let me just go ahead. We're gonna move down and do our other hole. So plus inch and a quarter. Okay, now we'll go in with our 5 16 tap size drill. Use that cutting oil to keep them chips from galling and packing in there. Okay, now we have our counterbore tool mounted in a collet. What I like to do is bring this down against the hard stop on the, on the quill. So it's not touching the cutter yet, but we're down on this stop right here. And what we'll do is raise the knee up until it touches. And then I'll set my, uh, my knee to a zero and we're gonna go 9 16 deep with this. Might help if you go forward. You don't have to spin these real fast, even though we're cutting aluminum. We'll run it up to about 200 right there. So what we're gonna do is just bring the knee up until we get a cut started. Just about there. All right, there we go. There's our touch off. We'll just go ahead and stop it. And then I'm gonna set the knee to a zero. And now we can raise this up and I bring the knee up the amount that I want to counter bore. So one, two, three, 
four, five, and we'll go 60, how about 65? 565. And I'll just do this by hand, keep it oiled. Just peck it so you can break the chip. All right, there's the bottom of our stop. Well, I definitely goofed that one up, but we're not in the, we're not out of the game right here. I was, uh, I had that opposite, so I was supposed to go three eighths deep, and I was thinking the diameter, so we went 565 deep instead of 375 deep, but that's okay. We still got material here uh, that's going to pull this tight. There's no big deal. It's just going to go down in there further. So, another just dumb mistake because I'm rushing through this. And I shouldn't be, I'm trying to get it done. So no mistake or no excuse. I got it right there. Uh, where's it at? Where's our counterboard right there? 560, 562 diameter, three eighths deep. In my mind, I was thinking 562 deep instead of 375. So what do you do? Let's go ahead and just match this one. All right, there's our two counter bores. Gone too deep, but it'll work. I'll go ahead and put a chamfer tool in here and we'll go ahead and knock off those corners. I'm gonna use the same trick with our counter countersink. I got it down on a hard stop here. Just bringing the knee up until it chamfers it. That looks pretty good. All right, our drilling is complete. We'll take this guy out. We'll go to the flex arm, get the two, get the two holes um, tapped, and then we'll come back. I need to, I'll get the mess cleaned up here. We'll get the vise trammed and then slot it. What we'll do is go ahead and just flip it over and we'll use the, should be aligned here. Use the chamfering tool to chamfer these holes. Yeah, there we go. That's better. Now let's go tap it. All right, we'll go ahead and get these two holes tapped here. Now I just measured it. It should be a little bit shy of the very top of the flutes of where we can just stop. Right about there. And if I need to, I'll just go back in there with a hand tap and uh, clean the hole up completely. If I didn't go all the way through where it needed to. Just makes it nice and easy being able to do a simple tap op right here on the flex arm. Go ahead and get this 
this vise trimmed. I need to get another clamp over here on the ends there and get that clamp down, but we're nice and trimmed now. I got everything set up, ready to go ahead and cut our split in there. We're using a 1 8 uh, wide, 4 inch diameter slitting saw for this. And we'll go ahead and uh, get it touched off. I'm going to use the paper trick right here. I'll just run it, see if we can run it backwards here. There we go. So that'll be a couple thousandths from the surface. Keeps you from scratching it from the touch off there. And so let's go ahead and calculate our halfway. So two and a half, I'll just do the calculator so I don't mess this up. 2.5 divided by two equals inch and a quarter. We want half the thickness of our blade there. So we're gonna add 0 0.0625 equals 1.312 and a half. So one and five sixteenths. So let me set my collar to zero here on the knee. And let's start counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, and Let's go to 13 right there. So it should be the halfway point of our block. And it looks like it's halfway. I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, touch the diameter there and step it over about a inch and a 16th. That'll make sure that it goes into the into the bore there as we are. That's 15 16 so that'd be an eighth of an inch over. And all right, I already see a problem. All right, I didn't, uh, I didn't figure that. All right, I'm gonna have to redo what we just did. What, what's gonna happen if I run across here and right now, the workpiece is gonna work, uh, run into this nut right here. So I actually need to bring this down out of the collar a little bit. I didn't think about that till I just saw, but that's what you do when you get everything set. You try to make sure you're clear. Decided we're gonna try this end mill holder since I'm using a stub arbor to hold our, our slitting saw and it has a welding shank there. So for the set screw to tighten it up. So let's try that. I think that'll give it the clearance that it needs. be it right there. I got to reset my depth again, but I want to go into our inch and a sixteenth. I think that's going to clear. All right, I think this is going to work out really good. I've got it offset where it needs to be. It looks like it's going to be just enough clearance there to miss that corner. And don't mind this, what looks like it's wobbling on that, that end mill holder. That's just from uh, whenever it was heat treated and after it was ground, that part wasn't running very true with, with the rest of the tool holder. But the tool holder runs nice and straight. I'm just saying, don't worry about that. It just makes it look bad. All right, I think we're ready to go for it here. Hopefully we'll have some good luck with this. I'm concerned about chatter, but let's see. Let's see what happens. We've got our... Noga cool blowing on the back side there to help lubricate everything and help blow the chips off. Take it nice and easy. Slow it down. That's 185. 
Well, that worked out pretty good. Didn't have any problems. You're always going to get just a little bit of chattery vibrations when you're doing these slitting saw setups like this, especially on these particular type of milling machines. You just, it's, it's hard to get away from it. If you're using something like the Kearney and Trekker, a big solid milling machine, you can do operations like this and all you hear is just the, the chip being cut. But anyway, I'm real happy with it. I'm gonna go ahead and vacuum all this up, get this cleaned up, and we are just about finished with our machining on this block right there. I wanted to point out that I am coming back through these 3 8 holes with our 2564, uh, so I have proper clearance with them bolts there. I've already got this one drilled. And that way I, I can just watch it through this split. Come down where I just touched that threaded hole and that's good. But I always drill it on size for your pilot. That's why we drilled it three eighths. So a, a, a bolt would still fit in there, but it's better if you got a little bit of clearance for that thing to move around. So technically that is finished minus, we got to do some deburring on our uh, split there. But other than that, this guy's finished up. Just making sure that both of the holes are uh, fully tapped all the way through. It felt like it had about a half or maybe one thread there that wasn't quite cut. Last little bit. I'm going to give this Noga uh, a try. This is for deburr and slots, keyways, things like this right here. But it's extremely sharp because it's still a new tool and it can dig in if you're not careful. But it does a good job. Just like that. You just have to be mindful about how much pressure you're giving it and it deburs that nice and easy. Same thing with the ends and then on the inside there as well. See if we can get that, get that inside. Perfect. Well, here it is all cleaned up. Just use some of the chlor-free degreaser to get all the oil off of it. And everything is deburred nicely. I think it turned out pretty good. Fits just like I designed it. Where the Harleys are hauling butt today. So all we got left really is just, we need our two socket head bolts. We need our mounting bolts for the back there. And this guy, this part of it's finished up. The tube is gonna be the next thing in line I need to work on. I need to get the slot milled for a key and then 180 out, another little slot for this guy. I wanted to give you a little better shot of that in case you couldn't see it at the beginning of the video. That little tab that sticks up is what's gonna slide in. So we're gonna slide it in here and when we push it in there, it's going to engage a little slot that I'll mill in there to keep that keeps it from pulling out 
And then on the opposite side, like I said, we'll have a key welded in there that's going to line it this way and that keeps it the anti-rotation. It'll keep it in there. I was trying to come up with a clever way to, uh, to clamp it and so we could certainly split it and, but I, I'll have to machine something else if I want to make it a little more fancy where you got like a bolt or something that you can uh, clamp it. But I think I'm going to try it without that first and see if just the, uh, the keyway and the slot for this little tab right there will be enough. And if not, I can certainly just split it. I think even a simple uh, clamp around it, like a hose clamp that I can tighten up with a couple slits down this tube might even work on tighten it up. So I'll just worry about that um, as I get to this part of it, but we got the block done, which is what I was working on today. So I'm happy with the way the block turned out exactly like I designed it with the exception of the little deeper counterboards there, but it's not a big deal at all, but it looks pretty good and it's going to do exactly what I was hoping for. So I'm going to, I'm going to work on this next and, and get these slots milled in this tube. And I want to show you guys what this is going to look like mounted up. So I'm going to follow up with uh, mounting this on to the RV with the post there and, and showing you guys what this is going to look like as the, uh, as everything is completed and ready to go. I'm working on the post for the uh, Starlink antenna. I actually forgot my, my other camera at the house this morning. So we're just going to get a couple shots with my phone here. I got a slot milled in there using a 3 16th end mill. And that slot there is what's going to be the catch for the little plastic tab. Once it slides down into that tube, that little uh, plastic tab will catch that edge and that'll create it uh, or keep it from lifting out of there or pulling out of the tube there. So we got that done. Now we're going to go ahead and use the spacer and rotate it 180 degrees. And on the opposite side, we're going to mill a three, or I'm sorry, a 7 16 wide keyway in there. That's gonna be where our 7 16 keyway is. We're just using a 3 8 drill to, uh, to cut the ends. And we'll put an end mill in there and then mill that slot. Here's our first test with the antenna in the, in the pole here. And you can see the narrow slot that I milled is for this tab to catch, and it works. So it just, just grabs that edge and keeps it from lifting out of there. Now what I plan to do on the back side, we've got our 7 16 slot. I'm going to machine an aluminum key that's going to get welded in here. And what I've decided to do is drill and tap through the key and we'll have like some kind of like little finger knob. So a screw that we can just manually tighten it with our fingers. That'll actually push this piece here over into that sidewall and just kind of keep everything nice and centered in there and square. This is something that I have in my, in my possession, but just kind of, I won't use this. I'm going to try to find something a little bit better, but this is the idea is uh, once that key is welded into the slot, we'll have a little knob right here that we can just screw into there and just push it on the inside and just kind of snug it up. So this is the key unfinished. I still got to mill it down. It's a little bit too thick or too wide, should I say, but you can see that it's going to fit right there just like it should. So we got a good, sliding fit so it shouldn't bind up and I'll show you how it's going to fit over there in the tube now. All right, this is our 7 16 slot we milled and here's our key. Got a nice fit in there. So I'm going to mill that down so it's not so wide, but we'll stick it in there. I'll probably just dress the ends with the radius to match up with the uh, radius of the slot and I'll have it to where it sticks up a little bit and then we'll have a, we'll have a hole drilled and tapped through there as well for our little finger screw that we're gonna put in there to tighten it all up. So making some headway, we're almost done. When we get this guy milled, we'll stick it in there, get everything squared up, and then we'll actually TIG weld this in place. Okay, so here is our aluminum key. I, do, I don't have it drilled and tapped yet because I don't know what size um, of these guys that I'm gonna order yet. I gotta look that up. I just wanted to get it to this point. 
and we've radiused the ends uh, using a corner rounding end mill. And I've got that one kind of radius there a little bit as well. So we can put this in here like that. And you see it fits the slot pretty nicely. All right, and it'll just get welded in there. We'll be able to put a little fillet weld on each side to hold that in place. And you see the inside, the uh, key will line up. Here's a little test fit so we can see how it's gonna work. Just like that. All right. This side has the notch to keep it from lifting out of there. And like I said, we're gonna have some kind of finger screw here that we can just lightly snug that up and then it'll square it up nicely in there and push it over against that notch uh, for the uplift. But I think it's working out pretty good. That's a, it's just kind of come together with whatever I had and, and what was available how we had to machine this to, you know, fit something right there. I'm real happy with it. I ended up widening this out a little bit further. I used a quarter inch end mill and just made it a 16th wider just to make sure that I had enough room for that tab to stick out and catch that lip there. I think it was just fine, but I just decided to give it just a little bit more clearance there. And then once we get our finger knob and actually I ordered these and the bolts for our block today from McMaster, they should all be here tomorrow. So we've got all of our mounting bolts and then uh, one of these guys for a quarter 20 threaded uh, threaded stud there. And then that will finish this up. I'm real happy with it. I mean, I think it's, it's gonna work out really good and had fun drawing this up with our fusion and making a nice print there that we could, that we could follow. And then we have, our, we have our block there that we made, pretty cool. All right, well, that's gonna wrap up the machining part of it. Once we get this guy fitted up on the Kodiak, we'll show you what it looks like. That's gonna work, man. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Okay, so our new Starlink, our custom Starlink mount is now completed. We have the block mounted up here on the trailer tray. Got it mounted up using uh, stainless steel hardware. We got stainless steel bolts in here. Everything's coated down with nickel anti seize. And the only other thing I'd like to do to this eventually is maybe uh, send this out to have it anodized. I just don't have time for that right now, so we're just gonna roll with it. But that's just gonna live here all the time. Okay, so that's mounted on there and it worked out really good. We've got our, here's our finger knob in there. Ordered that from McMaster car as well. We got our key welded in there and this is ready to go. So Did let me you already tell them about the pole? The pole? Yeah. I think I mentioned that at the beginning of the video. Okay. This, in case I didn't, I think I did. This was used by my granddad in his camper. And I believe what it was, was a pole for a canopy. He had several of these and I think he used them for some kind of canopy. You can see that he, this is a hole that he drilled in them. I don't know, maybe he had some kind of like little stand or something that he put them on. I'm not really sure. I just think that's cute. But there was several of these and over the years we ended up using it all for projects, jobs, whatever. And this one was on that metal rack over there. That old ugly metal rack. I've had it sitting out there for years. It was still painted red. So I cleaned it up. I think it's really cool that my granddad used this for his camping back in, I'm gonna say the 80s, maybe early 90s. I'm not sure how far back this goes. It could be in the 70s. 
And now here it is, three generations later, we're using the same thing for camping as for well. For our camper. Yeah, for our camper. I love that. For modern technology, yes. holding a satellite, or I'm sorry, an antenna. <laughs> so anyway, all right, let me show you. So here's the, here's what the Starlink usually looks like, okay? And we'll probably still use it like this occasionally. I'm not saying I'm gonna put this, put it up here every time, but it does come with the stand here, all right? And so to take it off, this is how you pack it up. You just push that and it pulls out of that, okay? My point to doing this was to try to eliminate it sitting on the ground because you know you end up walking around it or it may be positioned to where the, the Kodiak is kind of in the way of getting a good signal. So I wanted to get it up above the top of the Kodiak so it has a little bit more clear view of the sky, get it off the ground so that it's not in our area and it's just not sitting on the ground for somebody to maybe come up and grab anyway. Or okay? kick even or whatever. Yeah, all right. Now Trip the other hazard. question that we've had is why don't you just buy the one that mounts on the top of the camper? You can get those too, but here's, here's the thing. We've already invested in this. Yep. We've already purchased this, so why not use it? Also, using this system allows it to be completely mobile. It doesn't have to be with our Kodiak. We can take this with us in the car on road trips if we want yep. to. So and we've used it in our house before. We've used so. it here when our internet has been down. Yes. All right, so we didn't want one that's permanently on the top of the camper. Yep. I wanted to be able to use it for different applications. So let's go ahead and see what it's gonna be like to mount this guy up. So you just line that key up, stick it in there, and I'll just lightly snug up that screw. I'm not gonna tighten it up real tight. You just snug it, that's all you gotta do. All right, and then just pick it straight up. That is just cute. Slide it down in there. And so you can rotate it whichever way we need to. It's typically either north or south. So we can rotate it whichever direction we want. And then I'll have one of these hex keys in my truck. I got a few tools that I keep in the drawer, or the, uh, the door, I mean. And all you gotta do is just give it about a quarter turn, snug them bolts up. It's got it clamped. That is not coming out of there. That is just cute. You know, and this isn't something that somebody necessarily is going to be walking by with one in their pocket and go, oh, no. you know what? I like that. that. I'm going to take that. <laughs> you got to have an Allen wrench to be able to take it out of there. So there we go. And then the cord will uh, go to the modem. A lot of times we actually plug the modem up on near the back where the power pole is, wherever the power pole, I usually plug the modem in there. Or in the case where we're going to be using it out in the Southwest for our dry camps, we've got that portable battery. Uh, portable power station i think it's called and you know that may just be sitting right here i may set it right here and we can just plug the modem in right there yeah you know this or great if we need to hook it into the honda generator it can yep. it can plug in right there so that's it i'm real happy with the way it looks it looks awesome it's kind of custom and you designed this i just came up with a design yourself which is just adorable i came up with a design um by seeing this plate here and I saw all those bolt holes in there and I'm like, we can just mount something to that. And it just, you know, just went from there coming up with some kind of uh, block that I could bolt up to that, have a post in there. I figured out the size of the post I needed and I found that over on the rack. I'm like, that's the, the I didn't even size. have to cut it. It was already six <laughs> foot long. That's, that's so awesome. Yeah, it was meant it, to be, babe. Yeah, it really was. So there is our custom Starlink antenna mount for our Kodiak travel trailer. Yay! So hopefully that's going to work out good. And, uh, you know, we'll give the folks over on A-Bomb Adventures uh, an update on uh, how this system is working for us. Yep. Yep. So that's well it. Well done, babe. Yep. I enjoyed that one. I think we've just about got all the custom mods done that I'm planning on doing to the yes. Kodiak here. Yes. Now it's just loading now i just want to get in it and go, and go. instead of yes build this fix that yeah. maintain this yeah. i just want to get it and go yeah yes let's do that <laughs> yeah let's uh let's get it and go all right let's go to the desert okay sounds good all right we'll see you guys out there